for a special evening of poetry. Um, we're very fortunate to have Ed Roberson here with us tonight. His eight books of poetry are informed by his extensive travels and influenced by spirituals, the blues, and the visual arts. Among other recognition, he's also the distinguished artist in residence at Northwestern University, where he was a teacher and mentor of our very own Jim Davis. Jim is a student here at Harvard and a graduate of Northwestern and Knox College. His work is widely published and has won multiple awards, including the Line Zero Poetry Prize. Jim is also a celebrated visual artist, showing his paintings and collage in Chicago, Boston, St. Louis, and Denver. His next solo exhibit will be right across the street in the gallery of Gutman Library on April 8th. <laughs> and he wants you to know you're all invited <laughs> April 8th. Jim found poetry while traveling the world as an international semi-professional football player, winning championships and personal accolades across Ireland, Spain, Italy, and Austria. Poet and critic Reg Gibbons calls Jim's work dazzling. He says, what characterizes Jim's work is an astonishing imaginative energy as both a poet and a visual artist. Others have referred to Jim as prodigious and prolific. Personally, I think of Jim as the intersection of so many diverging interests and talents and I'm amazed by his ability to draw inspiration from every one of them in creating his poetry. It's my honor to introduce him this evening. Please join me in welcoming my friend and colleague, the poet Jim Davis. That was excellent. Thank you. Hi guys, thanks for being here. Um, thanks for braving the rain. Thanks Anita, that was excellent. I know you get stage fright sometimes. Um, we did not show. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about, I will introduce Ed in a moment as well. Um, but I decided to lead off. This is very unprofessional. I'm taking my gum out. I hope no one's offended. Um, I just, I'm going to lead off with some things I wrote um, while in Ed's class. Um, so, and I, and I really like this idea because not only were they informed by a brilliant human being, but um, I also have this default where if you don't like them, I can also blame uh, <laughs> the brilliant human being um, as my former teacher. So, I'm going to try to roll through these. If you have questions, even if that's atypical, um, feel free to ask. I, I probably recommend saving them till the end, but sometimes I have this tendency, I go fast. Uh, I, I, Excuse me? That's highly unprofessional, actually. We're off to a bad, we're not off to a good start in terms of professionalism. Um, but, I, but I do tend to move quickly. Um, these poems are kind of about that. When I first started writing poetry, I was, uh, I was traveling the world, and I just kept going and going and going. Uh, I was obsessed, essentially. I just kept moving with it. Uh, and a, a mutual friend of ours, um, Simone Mensch, who's also a teacher, said that I would kind of cast out a line and reel it back in, and, and whatever came with it would be part of the poem. Um, and they were just too darn long. So I've tried to force myself, I've tried to give myself a form to push up against, and it's been, uh, they're, they're pretty quick. So anyway, with that in mind, <clears throat> the first one's called Born Different, and it begins with a quote from Shelley, and that is, the wilderness has a mysterious tongue. Born Different. The mute swan inside a buttery dream is rising into the ridges of wilderness where the woman giving birth to a lion can be seen, and she is small, and she is happy to be a mother after so many years. The old war has ended, and the slick new war blinks to life, in licking him clean centuries compressed, and she cannot untangle black roses from thorns and stems like the swan's neck, bend in ruby slippers she demures and curls inside a, pl a prayer. You and you and you were there. The fury of a match on the wick of a red candle creates a shadow. The silence here can be so deep, it's heavy. Um, the next one is directly from Ed's class. Does anyone know David Lynch? Is that a familiar thing? Okay, keep him in mind. If you do, if not, Google. Um, if I can find it. And I can. It's called Minerva in the Curs. <clears throat> Minerva in the Curs. She smokes cigarettes in an apron in the kitchen. All the violins have been smashed to ribbons. 
In France, a Frenchman died from poison talcum powder and one long hair in the back of his throat. The Clydesdales froze in the barn that winter and shriveled into little ponies. Pity. He chipped his right rear lingual molar on the silver spoon stuck in his mouth during a seizure. The music is composed of squander by squander. Minerva's curs chase birds made of wool and parallax. She trained them to tie the boy's shoes. Torment relaxes in violins and empty passing taxis. She stubbed her cigarette on the horizon and brushed his hair as he slept. You can applaud lightly between these. That would make me feel better. <laughs> Thank you. That's not, don't go over the top, please. All right, I'll try to put some in the real world now. Uh, maybe a little bit of narrative. Um, if this one doesn't conjure, at least in terms of sound, um, Adam and Eve, uh, and Romeo and Juliet, and things like that. Hi. Um, don't worry about it, because that means it's appropriately hidden. It's called Heisenberg's Uncertainty. Um, it also has a quote, all musicians are subconsciously mathematicians, that's from Thelonious Monk, and it goes like this. Werner crossed his corduroy legs and stirred his coffee slowly, wanting her to look at him wanting her to wallow in quantum jazz. He could only ever speak of bluebirds and chants. He knew the size of her dancing shoes and let his roaming glance affect her path. Tragedy is a metrical arrangement, one stress away from comedy. Hitler slipped on a banana peel and no one knew how to react. She did not notice his subtle shifting, the beauty who tongued her sweets and moved like an eve, readying the atoms of sunset behind her as she picked another apple from the basket and sunk her teeth into the meat of its eclipse. Gently. Um, good. That was much better. That was good. Um, okay, this one is called After Galileo Lipped Up Heaven's Skirt. Um, that's right. After Galileo looked up heaven's skirt, men in soft hats scoffed, wiped their mouths, and threw bones to the hounds. It's always those who stand to lose most who are busiest inventing histories. Alchemists under Alabama circus tents had rattlesnake scars along tanned arms like road maps from Pisa to Birmingham. Sin sucked out through the puncture. Consider that if 1,000 monkeys spilled 1,000 salt shakers, they'd create only a partial image of our galaxy. Someday your way home and mine will be the same. Will be the sound between tendons in the wrist of the poem, turning over to read an astronomical fortune. You will hold the reins to my future and say, sing it again. I will. A little bit louder. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Uh, damage. Clumps of dirt on the root of magnolias after storm. Curious clay ornaments wink like statues and smash things suffer on the boulevard across from Assumption Church in abstract blue. Felonious monk seal painted on a collectible plate. To kneel played feel and beat again on ukulele. We beat on upturned buckets like da 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 dum tequila. The captain put a spell on mothers wheeling babies as bouquets of daisies wave goodbye to bees they'll never host again. I go crazy in late spring, said the sprouting girl. He'd been blithely serenading through the wall. Um, this one is called On Picasso's Women in Blue, 1949. It's a painting at our museum. Uh, if anyone wants to go check it out. I wrote this in front of it. Picasso's Women in Blue, 1949. Eating blueberries on the beach, she pauses to play nighttime's ruined fiddle, which breaks like cries of whales in the harbor. Isn't a general fear of death enough? I don't want to get any closer, she said, to her wolfish father posing on the silhouette hill, howling oblivion, that familiar void felt by painters, poets, and the blue women of Rubens' portraits, Rothko's transcendental abysses, and Pablo eating dinner in the dark with Vermeer's
timeless ladies, their pale hands folded over laps of colorful dresses as patient light ribbons through the chamber, all staring patiently from that same open window. If you've seen, thank you. Thank you. Um, is time passing slowly or quickly? We have, I feel like I'm reading a lot, but I think we're okay on time, right? Shoot, I just did something. There you go. Okay. All right. This one, see, I'll try to go slow enough where you can see the image, like the scene in this. It's called Deckhand. Floorboards creak as he tiptoes to the bathroom, which in the middle of the night, in the middle of the ocean, is over the rail. He spots the island host of gorgon orgies, their wolfish gurgles feigning song. Still, he revels forward in his midnight piss-break stupor, untutored in the ways of, the, of allure, looking past the floating carcasses strewn like crackers in the clam chowder he was dreaming of when he woke. Their song subsumes their stony gaze, and he would leap, but his ankles caught in the rigging, tightly coiled, the hulls attacked by swells as he glides past the isle into unforgiving winds, which throw his wistful stream back up on deck. Caught, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, this one's called Sappho at the Brookfield Zoo. We're from Chicago. That's where the Brookfield Zoo is. And, so, and she's from Chicago, too. <clears throat> this, this one is uh, a little tricky, but I hope it lands. Sappho with the Brookfield Zoo, a prayer for Epiphany, then. She desires to leave Lesbos once and for nectar over ice while laughing at the pygmy hippo's idea that she might forever be young and pretty and her mother will plod, cautious and heavy, beside her all her life. Every night leaves as quickly as it came, buckets by the door full of lettuces, and as the prayer goes, gorge on whatever the world presents. Sappho leans over the rail. One hand holds a lemon ice, the other in her mother's. She wonders what will happen to all the red mylar ballrooms she let fly up and away into hero-worship skies. Small at first, mambo, then smaller. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to read like three more if I read them at this pace. Is that what it's... I, okay. Okay. I'm just going to go with it. I'll stop asking questions. This one's called 100 Uses for a Tin Can. 100 Uses for a Tin Can. My old blue sweatshirt smells like smoke. I've killed many flies with time, though time killed more than I in my magazine, stained like the can in the dirt that night by the fire, divine light dancing off its rings, somehow authoring its void. I imagined its prior life as a treehouse telephone, though it might have been Sandberg's pencil, pencil cup, a deer boot, or a hawk helmet. I am a nature poet. The campfire baked beans that bubbled over the brim and onto soft white logs. She was cold. I gave her my sweatshirt and stared into the flames. She would not keep the baby. My steady, burning eyes. This one's called, I put my pants on two legs at a time. Put my pants on two legs at a time. Brace yourself. I'm not like you. I float one loose boot over the top of a boulder to chisel it down into stones I can skip. The sty on my eyelid is heavy with bits of whatever infected Abraham Lincoln's exit wound or would have. Tail feathers from bright, colorful birds. We climb the pillar to see ourselves at the Fireside Bowl. Pause. I know that's not appropriate, but the Fireside Bowl is like a music venue in Chicago play. Faded in the brief moment between jump and don't that we constantly test. Subtle thunder of the masses. You can't crowd surf a floor punch. Everyone knows what I'm about to do. So they huddle together. They listen as I peel away my best obsessions, look directly into the camera, and say simply, I will love you all forever. Okay. All right.
I'm gonna go two really quickly. Really quickly. If I can find them. Um, okay, so, we were talking about this tonight. Um, when we were in class, we had someone... We got into a discussion as a class about um, whether or not rap was poetry. And... Um, it was, an, it was a good discussion. And I think um, there was someone on the other side of the fence. It was for that person I started this poem. This poem started as a cento, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. Here's what it is now. It's called When We Ride After Tupac, Superboy, and Ellen Bryant Voigt. Okay, I'm going to try to get this. Is a little, not a lot of pauses in this one, so i got to go fast. When We Ride. The volume was way up on Easy Street when the new kid tried to fill big shoes in tones of access, dissent, and liberation. Steel hand, glass jaw, it figures. Did you hear about the rose that grew from a crack in the concrete? Proving nature's law is wrong. It learned to walk without feet. With clipped wings, you learn to swim. It's that easy. It's not. The radio on the shelf in the, t in the shop took a long needle and punctured the thought bubble in the mayor's mouth and replaced it with bad news. Racism is real. Replace it with real news. Racism is bad. Replace it with a litany, a litany of things it was trying hard to say but careful to. And in its crackling radio voice, full of static and country music, was not taken seriously. The jester juggled pineapples at the corner. The pigeons protested statues in the park. A cat died. What is the role of testifying? What is the role of testifying? Testifying is the role of whatever after is what comes at the end of the book where syntax is a large, flexible calculus like cattle weaving through the valleys, interrupted with lilies and landmines left over from one war or other. Men are violent underground but mostly in the air, in the valley, after being seen picking lilies on their shepherding by other men whose lilies are buried. If conditional cows announce their rise into murky heaven and Apollo the old sees their want, he'll say how funny it seems. But by keeping their dreams, they will learn to make fresh air where there was none to breathe. Come back to the breath. Come back to the street, said the concrete, to the rose that grew and, li and long lived, though... Centuries of pedagogies ranting on access, dissent, and liberation. And liberation broke through the cracks in the concrete and made new cracks in the concrete. And though it was a slow process, it happened. And the flowers shook in unadulterated happiness, though no one else seemed much to care. Miles outside the city, a mower aims at the final lily in the row. Once threshed, the wind catches and spreads its seeds. That's the end of that one. Um, okay, I actually think we are right on time. I shouldn't obsess so much about it, Ed, but that's what's happening. Uh, okay, I have to read one. Given that we are uh, down on like Ed School, Ed School, uh, Ed School, whoa, um, and this is kind of a theme. <laughs> Uh, this one's for a mutual friend of ours, Reg Gibbons, um, and it's about teaching and being taught. It's called Red and Go Gold Ribbons. Pale fishing boats in the broad dark bay, captained by, by barbarians with scars across cold hard faces. Aboard, they drink what they can find. Pints of hopelessness spill over and into this life of happenstance which makes us, when we dance and spin and spit and sing, feel courageous. As a boy, he had wings of a fledgling phoenix which he trimmed in the great tile hall of a boarding school in Palo Alto. Fish in every ocean develop parasitic tongues to keep bug and host alive. They drink to the goodness of knowing and the splendor of unknowing, and they chase. They drink things that must be chased, of course, since by the time the boats knuckle shore, it's too late for feathers, and all the ribbons have become flags, and all the world's oceans are the same. Blue light of an invented fire, strange birds, and the boy beginning to molt his Philistine skin while standing on deck, coiling brilliant rope. Maybe I'll stop there, actually. Um, I, didn't even, I did not do this intentionally, but voices cast out, coiling brilliant, brilliant rope. You see where I'm going with this? Um, so I will just go ahead and introduce Ed. Um, 
I, I, uh, I don't think so. Oh, guys. What is that? Oh, sorry. Thank you, guys. That was... That was a special thing. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I've actually gone through this part more than any other part and uh, kind of chopped up, figured out how to filter through and, and give the most meaningful points of Ed's bio. We truly are lucky to have him here. I hope everyone realize, realizes the magnitude of this event, um, the second half of this event at least. Uh, Ed, um, in addition to his selection with the Natural po National Poetry Series, was a finalist for the Lenore Marshall Award from the Academy of American Poets, won the Iowa Poetry Prize, the, the Lila Wallace Writers Award, and from the Poetry so Society of America, the Shelley Award, uh, etc., etc. His books are, um, are staples in just about every library, including ours. Um, okay, so... Here, here's what I think of Ed's, Ed's work, and I didn't want to be too formulaic about this because I've heard him introduced a number of times, and I don't want to um, undercut what he does by trying to say what he does in my words because this wouldn't do it justice. Uh, I will say though that he is his work is sometimes familiar. He weaves us through sometimes complicated topographies, uh, which rope you in through sound and image. And this is, I think this is like true of all poetry of this sort. Um, the way an abstract uh, piece of art would, per perhaps. Uh, it pulls you in through sound and image, brings you just close enough to realize that there's something like really magical going on there, whether you realized it at first approach or not. But he definitely has that. I, um, I'm lucky enough, like I said, to have been taught by Ed, um, but I also consider him a friend. I don't. You don't have to reciprocate that, but but we. Uh, but every now and then we'll have breakfast in Chicago, and we'll talk about poetry. And I will come out of those sessions um, just like spending the rest of the day inspired. I'll just write all day, and sometimes I will um, write good poems, and sometimes I'll write bad poems. But I will just nonstop writing after being with him. And sometimes, usually at the end of those days, I'm a little sad because I realize after all of this that that I probably will never reach that level of brilliance. And I'm and I'm serious about this. Nathaniel Mackey refers to what he called a, a double-jointed syntax to get at things seriously that other people just can't get to. And I worked, uh, I, I used the word parallax in a poem. It was probably too unfamiliar to, to use in that sort of poem. But, it, but I think of that word when I think of Ed's work. It's essentially, he's able to somehow, instead of look at things straight on, see kind of through them, and it's like this diffracted, refracted light. He sees things from angles, multiple angles at the same time, you'll see what I mean in a second, uh, that normal human beings just aren't capable of doing. It's truly an impressive thing. Um, we were talking tonight, here's, I have to quote this, I hope this is okay. Um, he was talk, we were talking about human life as the big, as like the thing, the big thing, being the universe or whatever, um, uses to try to figure out what the specifics of itself are. Like what is a drop? It's part of you, but what is it? So it relies, this universe sort of relies on our sentences to get to the nuance. Uh, and, and, you, and that image of the universe sort of staring down at a paper cut, trying to figure this thing out, um, it's magic. He does that stuff all the time. He's a master of metaphor, a master of syntax. He's an absolutely master, masterful artist. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say he's a genius. Uh, and he's my friend, so please give a round of applause for Ed Roberson. at uh, Harvard up here to control him. <laughs> I see you failed as badly as we did. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he's a ball of energy that was really a delight to have at the school, and I'm glad he's enjoying himself here, and I hope you're enjoying having him around. There's sort of no one like Jim. Um, and uh, he'll leave you with lots of things to do. And usually they're good things, uh, some project he's designed up for you. Well, thank you for coming, and uh, I'm really thankful that you invited me to, to come. I'm glad to be here. And what I'd like to do is uh, kind of 
read um, sort of there's been a sort of a new discovery in in my life um, I retired for the second time I retired once from Rutgers University then I came out of retirement and went to Chicago and went to uh, University of Chicago and then to Northwestern and, uh, and then I retired again uh, <laughs> this past this past year I retired again um, and uh, I was taking my house apart in uh, New Jersey and I discovered a manuscript that I thought I had lost um, right after my first book uh, a friend a couple of friends and I uh, hopped on the back of two BMW six six fifties and um, went to um, uh, drove cross-country to California uh, stopping to visit all of our friends sleeping on people's couches hanging out in people's backyards just sort of having a good time and going like hell to get across back across country in order in time to get uh, to class for the fall semester uh, and along the way I wrote a lot of um, uh, poems a lot of um, images and things that we saw and uh, somehow or other, over the years, moving from place to place, I lost the the the, the manuscript. And uh, just, uh, but I shouldn't say I lost the manuscript, because what happened was that those poems were so ingrained in me that I carried them, even though I didn't have them in front of me. I uh, carried them in the ideas. I carried them in, in the, some of the imagery, and I've been using this manuscript for the last 30 years. It's been gone, but I've been using that manuscript for the last 30 years as a resource, and it was amazing. It was actually frightening at, at first. I found it, and uh, it took me a month before I actually opened it up and actually went to read it, because I wasn't quite sure whether I wanted to meet myself that young. I wasn't exactly sure, I didn't remember uh, exactly how good or how bad the poems were. So I just continued cleaning up the house and getting the house ready for sale and always on the side there's this manuscript that I needed to look at. Um, finally when I did look at it, what I discovered was mostly what I just told you, that I had never lost the manuscript, that it was always a part of me and it had always been a source for the things that I uh, had continued to write over over the years. Uh, and I was happy to see that. Uh, it was sort of frightening to realize that, um, that I hadn't grown up or that I hadn't grown in a certain way that people think you're supposed to grow. Uh, I could see some of the uh, 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 kid excitement that I had at that point, you know, jumping on the back of a motorcycle and, and going cross country. And you have to remember that these are the days when, uh, uh, well, I, I can remember not, not too far from, um, not too far from uh, St. Louis, we pulled in one night and we wanted to know where could we get something to eat. Simple gas station, we just wanted to know where to get something to eat. And the guy said, you all need to keep moving. We don't like no easy rider types here. And so we couldn't even get gas at some stations. There was a point outside of Sioux City, um, where, uh, uh, Sioux Falls, um, where um, we ran into another motorcycle gang. The, the gang of three of us, two motorcycles and three people, ran into a, a pretty well-equipped uh, motorcycle gang and uh, we sort of had to ride a little bit for our lives and there's a little uh, I've got poems that I've written about over the years of what it's like to be on the road just the image of being on the road to wherever you're going to go or wherever you want to be and seeing come up on the road all the time these signs but the signs have bullet holes in them you know, um, which is something that any of you who've made the ride cross country, you know what those bullet holes are. Um, and we were sort of the model for, or sort of like the image of trouble in this country. Uh, the one of uh, my friends was a painter, very good painter, uh, but he also taught uh, for 
a living until he was able to be able to support himself as a painter, as a high school teacher. Um, my other friend was Andrew Welsh, who had just finished his dissertation, uh, which was turned into The Roots of Lyric. Some of you may know that book if you're interested in poetry. Um, it's uh, the use of anthropology. Andy and I studied a lot uh, together, talked a lot while he was working on his, his dissertation, and I was learning to write poetry. Uh, what I'm saying here is that this book is the book in which I actually learned to write poetry. I had one book published, and you know, it won prizes and stuff, but really to learn how to do something, you have to do it up to your own expectations, maybe even beyond your expectations, you hope. But then you have to deal with, okay, what next? And it's that second and third book where you decide that you're not going to just do what you thought you could do, you're going to do more. So I, in the second book that was lost, and the second book that was actually in fact published, uh, those two books were where I really learned to write poetry on my own terms, in my own definition. So if you don't mind, what I'd like to read to you is maybe the first four or five poems out of this manuscript that's 35 years old. Um, if you So we're leaving Pittsburgh, and some of you may know uh, Pittsburgh as uh, Triangle City. We have uh, the Allegheny River come from the north, and the Monongahela River uh, come from the uh, south on Angle, uh, meet at the point where they, both rivers join and turn into the Ohio River. The Ohio River uh, goes um, uh, in, into uh, uh, Kentucky and uh, eventually joins up with the Mississippi. So you'll see these. So sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to check. I don't know what the norm is. Would it be inappropriate to film you when you read these? Or what? Film me? Yeah, yeah, just like my eyes. As long as you don't flash the light in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem, man. No problem. You know, just uh, uh, I'm, I'm half blind anyhow, so it won't make any difference. <laughs> So there I'm going to be mentioning some, some names. They'll sound like Indian names, because Native American names, because they are Allegheny, Monongahela, uh, Ohio. Uh, I'm going to be naming these names. And there are cities that I'll mention, like uh, Black Earth or uh, Blue Earth, which are actually cities uh, in the Midwest, in the northern Midwest. Um, where uh, they're farm cities, where uh, the large industrial farms actually raise stuff that turns into uh, the Jolly Green, which you pull off the shelves as the Jolly Green Giant. So um, those kinds of things. There will also be a section in here where uh, you'll hear uh, an old spiritual, uh, Didn't It Rain uh, is, is the spiritual. Um, and there will be a little bit of this talking about rain and what rain does to get the country to get the country to grow. Uh, there's a little bit in here about uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, a motif he picked up. Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, some of you may know, actually used a lot of uh, Central American, uh, uh, Native American uh, uh, themes, motifs in his in his design. And you see it out in the middle of nowhere, like in the middle of Minnesota, you'll see this beautiful warehouse that looks like it should actually be a church, but it's a warehouse, and it will have these Incan uh, inscriptions in it, uh, Mayan, excuse me, inscriptions in it. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that you're going to hear and hear. And uh, there's a point where the, wall, where the uh, bicycle breaks down, and uh, you, you'll, you'll hear that too. So this is a kid 35 years ago uh, trying to learn how to write poetry. As if I've seen enough, I put what I've seen between my eyes and think the trigger was my being born. As if I've been enough, I put where I will have been clear across country and try to make it. So the trigger, what I'm up against, is going to get pulled on it this trip. I see people look at each other and see the historical figure, the driving, the guiding figure, cross country. 
wanting to get there, they drove each other and won to a position where he sought the next motherfucker to drive him to anything and it was himself. This whole trip from Jump Street was up against and people came armed with beginnings loaded for starts. And the killer was, it wasn't any fairy tale enchanted white horse they got on for being and couldn't get off. It was white. It was the sails of the prairie, clouds and schooners and space with no overboard that menopausal Europe and its fairy virgin broke down vessel on a washed up shore. Beside two rivers just made one. Beside the river here, the Mississippi, just knew now from the Allegheny and Monongahela, just became the Ohio before we hit the Ohio line, before we're out of town, before the just then Ohio is the Mississippi, we pull up beside a city truck with a dump full of young bloods, black boys, in a dump truck, like in Mississippi. At the West End Bridge leaving Pittsburgh, headed for Ohio's state line, which we will actually never see, the first of those drawn lines, which we will never see, we see that this is Mississippi, here, beside the two rivers just made one. Not even out of town, another load of brothers sees two cycles and a brother loaded on the back headed cross country. Five hand waves, some where you headed jive, some black power hands, one peace sign, one you'll never make it, and one pair of still leaving with me eyes. These, I promise us, I swear to these eyes, as the slaves flew, we will, we will, will, we will make it, cause when we made the middle passage, didn't we walk the waters? Didn't we have the waters paved with the skulls of our grief for each other? Didn't we make it on ourselves? When we crawled under the Mason-Dixon, didn't we jump the fence over Jordan? Didn't the river rebed behind us and turn blood because the bloods wouldn't tell? Didn't we make it to this one side on our other? on ourselves. Didn't we get put up when we went back down home? Didn't we hide in each other? No hotels. That we stood uppity a chance of getting shot. Didn't we walk on the shadow years later of Emmett children who did? Didn't it make your step higher than just to walk? Didn't the westward push opening the country turn middle passage trying to shut us out panicked at the plow flat and hardness of our feet having stood on each other didn't we open the rock like our hearts didn't it bleed too to yield too to eat didn't it didn't it didn't it rain didn't it rain by the edge of town north is the same as south by the state line, the only line is broken out ahead by the toll. Directions make the contract on his throat. Turn to look too many, and the chicken of his head is twisted off. Everywhere there is to come from is come here to see it stand on his neck like a top. By Cleveland, the crossfire of getting north. The Underground Railroad, he can hear it under the road. And by Detroit, the, te the Teutonic mask of the mother of fast death in that cab over engine. Each double cuts off the top of all the hills, hunting for it, hunting for us. By Albion, the wind thinks itself apart to pieces. Its suburb part axes down its voices to trees. Indians that their roots drank to get big timber bleed back bricks through the windshields. The topsoil like cornices off these buildings. The land looks like the bottom of a dry lake. The clouds take any shape they please. An anvil is over the gold dome of Wisconsin. In Minnesota, the Mayans have slipped Frank Lloyd Wright a self-destruct motive in his warehouse 
for revenge. The landmark society is civil defense between two towns, Blue Earth and Black Earth. The jolly green giant is grown. The white blonde of their hair there turns green in the light of the shade loading trucks. They are vegetables. By the Mississippi, he merely has to pee. The family river come out of this everywhere there is, is to come to, come from, here. Well, look here. I'll stop there. You get an idea of what the manuscript goes on to sound like. Um, Also, in, in the, I hadn't planned to read this, but also in, in the, the manuscript, there's a, a note um, that was sort of like a um, um, uh, dictation on a movie that I had seen. And, I, and since I saw this movie and since I wrote this poem, you know, 30 some years ago, I've heard people talk about this. Uh, it, it, I saw it on television, this film. and. Uh, um, nobody seems to know who did it or where it comes from, except they do know that the f uh, photographer committed suicide after after this uh, was taken. Uh, if any of you know this, um, this movie, it's about Charles Mingus. To be here shooting. Uh, what it is to be here shooting. The final frames show Charles Mingus put out on the streets by the police, his instruments, his music, his school, his family. We continue to say, we continue to say it continues to be this way, as if traditional to audience. Our art out of adversity myth is as inept, untalented, a drunk aristocrat's response as is the learned applause in clubs come anywhere using feelings like change or positions. You don't have to look at the blues. In the opposite direction of what you're seeing, the score rises. Mingus's composition drowns out the voice over, or it winds up. I think it's the cameraman who committed, or who will be committing suicide shortly after this was completed. You don't see him or everything you see is him seeing. Charles's gun, his instruments, his music, the police, reason to be here shooting. Um, Mingus hadn't paid the, um, his rent on his studio and the landlord brought the police in r rather than just evict him, let him let him pull his stuff out. The landlord brought the police in, and so you see his wife and his children, and his his manu his his um, manuscripts might as well be uh, all sitting on the on the uh, on the street. And the um, thing that he says is that it continues to be this way. He makes a statement into the camera. It continues to be this way. Okay, those are the old manuscripts. If you, if you, that's sort of what the old stuff looks like. Uh, I want to now read. Um, um, I have a bunch of poems coming out in the Chicago Review out of the University of Chicago. Um, they're going to publish. Uh, a big hunk of the motorcycle poem, MPH, I called it. Uh, University of Chicago is going to publish that. Uh, but they're also going to publish a bunch of new poems. And my new poems are interesting to me because uh, uh, I had a brain operation uh, almost three years ago. And um, it's one of those things that uh, it's a simple thing. It's just dangerous. I mean, you just go in and pull faucet in there and let the faucet drain down and back into your stomach cavity. No problem. It's easy. You know, it's a little shunt, you know. Uh, but you have to put the shunt in your brain, which makes it a little crazier. Uh, and it's, it's like I say, it's n n not something that 
any surgeon couldn't do, except that it's a dangerous place to do it. So it's hard to get a surgeon to actually enthusiastically.